Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Welcome to Means of Creation, a weekly show where we are deep diving into the passion economy, which I know even, even though Taylor hates that phrase, um, <laughs> and talking about the future of work. I'm your host, Lee Jen, along with Nathan Boshez, and I'm really excited to be having this conversation today with our very esteemed guest, Taylor Lorenz, who is a technology reporter for the New York Times covering internet culture. Her reporting is consumed avidly by VCs, founders, really anyone that's curious about how the internet is shaping culture and how humans express themselves. She's written about topics like TikTok cults, TikTok mansions, a Discord community called the Gen Z Mafia, Triller poaching talent from other platforms, and other very online topics. And before joining the New York Times in 2019, she was a technology and culture reporter at The Atlantic and The Daily Beast. And here on the show, we're huge fans of her work, and we've been following her for a really long time. We think she understands more about the creator ecosystem than basically anyone out there. And so we're really excited to be talking to Taylor today about things like the tension between technology and VCs and the media world, what we can learn from influencers and creators about the future of entrepreneurship, why creators are finally getting the recognition they deserve among Silicon Valley, and more. And so without further ado, hi, Taylor. Thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You guys are also, I'm such a fan, so. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. That is so cool to hear. It's like weird to hear because you're like, (laughs) <laughs> like, what? No, I'm obsessed no. with everything you guys do and I read everything and like I mean I you guys are like serious experts in the space so I love I loved your piece uh Lee that you wrote on prop 22 and yeah oh thank you yeah no one prop 22 guys okay so so we have a lot of ground that we want to cover today so we'll just dive right in maybe the first thing that we should address is the term, the passion economy. So (laughs) uh, otherwise I think it'll be the the elephant in the room. Let's Let's just get get right into the debate. I yeah. emailed you guys yesterday because I like tweeted like I hate the passion economy and then I was like I should like email them and see if we can talk about <laughs> the whole team. I just hate the phrase. I mean, you would know more. I feel like you helped popularize it, so no shade. But you know, everyone's using it all the time, and I just worry about it because just the idea of like passion and like it's very much work. And I just I guess my my qualm with the phrase is that it has this like idea of like you have to be passionate about your work. And I mm-hmm. I'm very much someone that. Of, of, I, yes, of course you want to be passionate about your work, but like a lot of people rely on these platforms, you know, not out of passion, but out of necessity. And I just, I, I so yeah. worry that gets lost with the, the new catchphrase, but I know, you know, I think that's a very valid, that's a very valid point. And I think the, the flaw with any terminology is that it has its limitations and there's definitely exceptions to it. The term passion economy has taken off beyond my wildest imagination ever since I wrote the blog post last year about the passion economy and the future of work when I was still at Andreessen. And it's taken on lots of different meanings. People have adopted it to describe things that I never intended for it to be described. And it's interesting because I revisited my original blog post from last year wherein I coined the phrase. And Wait, I didn't realize that you coined the phrase. Yeah. I didn't even realize that. Oh my God, I feel really bad. I <laughs> no, it's okay. No, it's, all right. <laughs> it's all right. No, I love that it's become bigger than just me. Um, and, and it's really interesting because in that blog post, the term really refers to the nature of the work itself and how incentives are structured and how people are compensated rather than to the emotional state or the why that people are doing it. It was really referring to incentives, upside, ownership, control. And I used it really in contrast with the gig economy because in the old models of marketplaces in the gig economy, the incentives were structured in such a way where providers didn't really have any control over their work. They didn't have upside. The only way to grow their earnings was to just do more work, spend more time. And I think the the major contrast that that has with what I call the passion economy is that creators and providers on these new platforms now do have ownership over their own work. They have upside, even if most of them make very little money, there is a chance to be mega successful and no one is dictating what they make or create, which I think is inherently pretty motivating. Um, But you're totally right that there are creators who don't 
start it out of comfort. There are people who start it out of necessity. But yeah, I struggle with all of the terminology that we use. Creators, I struggle with the term passion. Like, I, no, I like, haven't found any. Economy is totally unproblematic, though. That one <laughs> no, is straight down. No, no, there is no perfect term. There's no perfect term. I think it's just, I guess my frustration with it mainly is that it, my beat has like, I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder because like, I feel like nobody took the stuff that I cover seriously at all. And especially VCs and like some people, not like, you know, a lot of people like yourself, who I know worked in that industry and other people at specific firms that have really understood the space, but it's sort of like now that now that there's this term that's popularized, they're sort of using it to talk about my work. And I, and I don't like that. Cause I'm like, well, you dismissed it for so long, but now a buzzword comes along and you're kind of like, now you are an expert. So it was, yeah, I, yeah it was sort of pegged off this other thing I did on this really cringy post about only fans that a VC wrote and sort of misunderstanding the platform. And so anyway, yeah, I didn't realize that you made, I, I mean, you're so synonymous with it, but I couldn't remember if you coined it yourself. So Thank you for saying it. No shade, but like you said, all terms have limitations and that's my only qualm with yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would also like to give a shout out to Adam Davidson who came up with the term around the same time that I did. We often refer to ourselves as the Newton and Leibniz of the passion economy. I think for both of us, um, we, we describe this economy in which people are emphasizing and leaning into their individuality in order to make money rather than doing something that's very commoditized where they're entirely fungible with someone else. And then the last point I'll make about this is that passion has somehow become synonymous in our culture with happiness and feeling joyful all the time. And that's not the original genesis of the word. Like passion comes from a Latin word that actually means to suffer. And if you are a participant in the passion economy, it doesn't necessarily mean that you feel happy and fulfilled every moment of every day. People I definitely don't. experience burnout. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, it is truly hard work. It's legitimate work and there is suffering involved, but I think it speaks to a greater sense of fulfillment and knowing that over time, hopefully it's worth the sacrifice. Yes. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting um, to think about, I, I'm curious, cause like this relates to the core thing of like the why, cause I'm guessing the original root of the word passion and suffering, it's like suffering, well, for the purpose of something you believe in and Taylor, it sounds like your critique is maybe a lot of people are participating and maybe suffering, not because it's something they believe in, but because they are compelled to for some other reason. I'm curious to hear more of like the stories of those kinds of people, the circumstances you're seeing, like, what are we, what are we maybe not seeing? Yeah, well, I guess my feeling is, especially like talking to a lot of young people, there's just this idea that is really exciting that's sort of like you can build a business on your own. Um, you know, you don't need to go through these traditional gate holders, which is all really amazing and powerful and gives so much opportunity to so many people. But it's also a lot of people are pursuing these careers because they have completely lost faith in the system. You know, this is not to say like, and I feel this myself as a journalist. I mean, I lucked out and got in around, you know, into traditional media eventually, but like, you know, I, I think for a lot of people starting out, they just see that there are no stable jobs out there and there's no, nothing that will offer you benefits and sort of like, this is their, this is their like only option for stability. And I just think that's really indicative of a larger broken system where, you know, as you know, like being a full-time creator or hustling and building your own business, like these are all really tough skills and it's really hard to succeed. And, um, you know, so it's hard. I think a lot of, a lot more people would take actually like sort of more stable jobs um, that don't require so much emotional investment and time and stuff if, if there was that stability. And I just don't think there is that stability in a lot of areas, especially media. Right. So, yeah. Absolutely. I think that it definitely also differs vertical by vertical and from different type of creator to other types of creators, which is another challenge with trying to describe uh, this entire category and generalizations. Um, just last week, we were talking to Casey Newton about how Substack um, has an emerging diversity problem and how most of the paid newsletter writers are white men because they're coming from a place of comfort where they can take this leap and leave their full-time roles at a media organization in order to carve out their own path. So I definitely think that there's pockets of creators who are doing it from a position of this is now a real legitimized path. It's a clearer, more socially acceptable path to take, but I definitely acknowledge that there's people who 
have lost their jobs, especially during the pandemic and are turning to creating content as a way to get by. Yeah. Or they're just young and that's what they see as stability, like, mm-hmm. which I don't blame them. I, I mean, if I was starting out now, I would not pursue a job with a traditional company. It, it makes no sense when you can build your own business, ideally, if you have the means to do so. So I think it's just a shift in, in that sort of view of employment. So, Yeah. yeah. So you've covered creators for a really long time, as well as the platforms that they use to actually build an audience and make a living. In that time frame, like what are some of the biggest shifts in mindset or psychology for the people who are creating content on those platforms? So many major changes. I mean, so much has changed since 2009. It's crazy. I mean, actually, I think 2009 was like the first YouTube collab house. If you think of this, I think it was called The Station, which ended up becoming Mm. Maker Studios, which was in Venice, where like... Lisa Nova, Shay Carl, like all of them lived. And it's just so funny to think of that because it's sort of birthed that like now when you see the hype house, you know, there's like houses all over LA of creators. Watching that progression has been really interesting. But I mean, also just the way that people approach these platforms, like people weren't approaching them as businesses back then. It was more of just like an outlet, more of a creative thing of self-expression. Now there's just so much more opportunity for monetization. And obviously these platforms have scaled to such an extent that you can really, it, it, it's really viable to kind of like blow up and, and have that be your, or not even blow up, you know, just have like a, like you sort of have spoken about like a, you know, core group of fans that just support you. So yeah, I would say scale and the normalization of sort of creating as a career are like the two, the two biggest shifts. And I would say in terms of another big thing, just, I would really, since like late 2017, 2017, maybe summer 2017 to now, there's just so much more of this industry being covered by the mainstream media. I think just the fact that I have a job writing about it, it, the New York Times speaks to that, but like that sort of goes along with the rise of Gen Z where like the sort of pop culture right now is very like tied in with youth culture and and those kids are kind of very steeped in the online world. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I think I, I read a little bit about the book that you are working on and it seems to touch on some of those topics around the next generation and how they're leveraging social media to become entrepreneurs and to start their own business. Um, I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit more about the major topics that you're covering in that book and what are some of the key learnings so far? Yeah. Oh my God. My editor is probably like tuning in because she wants to. (laughs) (laughs) It's so hard to write a book. I'm never doing it again. Um, (laughs) It's so hard. I'm a journalist too. So it's more narrative than, um, you know, I think like probably, you know, someone like yourself who I would love to read like a book that you write on this. Cause there's, there's so much to examine in that oh, way. But you. yeah, I would really love that. But, you know, I'm basically sort of like following this group of us young aspiring sort of like teenage creators in their goal to build a business and become brands themselves. And, um, sort of talking about the, it's, it cuts into a lot of the bigger issues and sort of how they use technology and stuff, but it's also very much like these kids' personal stories of trying to blow up on the internet and trying to start their careers. A lot of them are foregoing college and also they're outside of LA. Like I wanted to focus on people that were not in sort of already in the like entertainment industrial complex. So, um, yeah. I have to write it. I mean, I'm still, I've written like 20,000 words, but books have to be so long. I'm like, this is like writing like 50 articles. So (laughs) are you spending a lot of time going to TikTok mansions and (laughs) embedding yourself in that world? Yeah. I mean, I am usually, but like with coronavirus, I have to tell you, I am so freaked out. I was at one house last weekend and none of them had, none of them I cannot express how it's not a thing in that world. It is just not a thing. It is not a thing. Like sometimes they tweet about it. Oh, I'm taking it seriously. No, they're not. They're just yeah. not. So um, yeah, it's like I was like th- showed up with my full like N95 and face mask. But that's so hard too because you're basically trying to build rapport with these kids and like go with them. You know, for instance, like to the liquor store before the big party and hear about them talk and hear what their plans are and their content plans for the night. And like all of that that stuff, like you have to really, and not underage kids going like, but I'm talking more like, um, I don't know. I went with some 23 year old creator recently and that made me think of it where like his whole time he's like planning out the content for the night. And it's so weird because he was like approaching this party as like a content opportunity. And like, you need them to let you into their lives. And, um, it's very hard to do when you have this like shield and mask and they can't see your expression. And that's, it's been honestly very hard to report, but 
and doing it. So we'll see how it turns out. Yeah. Wow. Really risking your life to write this book. That's kudos to you. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I'm not going into any like really risky situations, but I am just overly cautious um, because I'm like technically high risk. So I'm just, and I had pneumonia twice last year and I'm like, I cannot get sick again. <laughs> like I can't. Yeah. Yeah. So there's been so many stories this year slash the last couple of years where it seems like the next battleground to woo these creators onto a platform and to retain them is increasingly money. And examples of this include Mixer poaching people from Twitch, Facebook Reels paying influencers for the cost of production. I read Um, a really good article somewhere about Triller. I don't know. (laughs) And Nobu (laughs) and Sushi Dinners. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And so I'm curious, where do you think this ends up going? Oh, by the way, Substack as well. I think there's been reports that Substack has paid journalists to go independent and compensating them in the form of upfront guarantees. In a way, this is kind of reminiscent of just like a new style of media company where you have to pay to acquire talent and have big lucrative contracts for them or potentially just employ them. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on where that's all headed. Yeah, it is interesting. I think to varying degrees of success, I think what we're seeing with some of this stuff is that you cannot actually buy your way to success like Mixer and Triller. I mean, Triller has really no organic usage. It's really low. It was actually way below Quibi on the app store. And I was like, that's not a good sign. Um, and, you know, and also they ha- they're, they're signing talent into non-exclusive agreements. So these ta- the talent is still just maintaining their base on TikTok and basically posting on this other app for money, but like not really investing there, aside from sort of like fulfilling contractual posting quotas and stuff like that. So I think we'll see where it all nets out, but I think it's like you have to, paying to acquire big people can work if you also have a really good product. Um, but if you don't have a really good product, like, people, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you get the top people from other platforms because you're not going to be able to retain the users. Um, so, I mean, Instagram reels actually, you know, reels has been paying creators and stuff. And, um, I've heard like actually a lot of creators really like that. Like, I think that reels right now is absolutely not competition for TikTok in the sense that it's just such a, it doesn't have all the feature set, right. That, that TikTok offers now, but I think that Instagram is a stable platform. It has scale. If they can, um, you know, if they can get the biggest TikTokers there and then also give them visibility, visibility and help them grow and help blow people up. Um, I think that that might be an example of a time where it really, it really pays, but I don't know. They also paid all these big YouTubers to make IGTV videos and hasn't really <laughs> right. paid off. So. It's interesting The I think there definitely have been some instances in which capital and having really deep pockets has been effective. Like TikTok in the past 18 months or so probably rose to its current level of prominence based on spending so much on user acquisition. I've read that at one point was spending a million dollars a day on user acquisition, which is just tremendous. And in the early days, trying to pull people from YouTube and Instagram and a bunch of other influencers. So that's definitely to me, an example of a success case in which capital can create a new successful social network that has network effects. But then there's been other examples where that tactic has not really worked. I think it's also notable that even, even, like to basically to compete on the level of like the incumbents of YouTube and Instagram and everything, like you had to basically be like a multi-billion dollar Chinese tech conglomerate. Like that is the only, like you, they, they were, I think according to the Wall Street Journal, they spent like a billion dollars on marketing in 2019. Like that's the level of spending that you have to do. So it's like, I, th- I feel bad for these other apps, you know, that come and yes, they're spending a lot, but I just don't think they have that budget to really go against some some big people but yeah i mean tiktok undeniably paid a lot to right. get where they are too but the product is also really compelling right i'm curious what t- so tiktok did they mostly spend on like user acquisition and some of those users would go on to be creators but it was kind of scattershot or did they also do the like nobu sushi dinner thing that triller's doing yeah they yeah, they did. Uh, well, they did. So they, most of it's on, was on user acquisition because, because also TikTok has such good discovery. So it, it's like right. the whole, you know, value of it is like, it blows people up. So I think if they get enough users, they'll have the interesting content, but they also did a bunch of stuff with YouTubers. They helped broker the big Chipotle David Dobrik deal that David got a ton of money to 
launched his TikTok. They, they sort of were out courting YouTubers. Vanessa Papas like came from YouTube, obviously was on the sort of creator team there. So she has deep ties in the creative community in general. I think also the, like the party that they hosted at VidCon last year, I wrote about it, but like, it was such a like who's who of the internet and catering to these people and being like, we actually care about you. And, and I do think that what TikTok did in terms of like really sort of going after creators and, and having this like stance of like being very creator first and being like, we'll blow you up. The, I, you know, I think that was really compelling to it, YouTubers that felt like that, in, that YouTube was taking them for granted or that they were stagnant. And then they're suddenly getting these huge numbers on TikTok, which are, you know, obviously not the same as TikTok view is not the same as a YouTube view, but I think like suddenly you can say to brands, I'm also getting a billion dollars on or a billion views on TikTok. And so that helps it's, it adds value to them too. So. Do you think that inflation is kind of misleading people or like a billion views on TikTok is really different from a billion views on YouTube, but do you think that they differentiate like creators differentiated enough, like as they should, like, do they discount any, the creator, TikTok view? any creator knows that like a YouTube subscriber is more valuable than a TikTok follower. Yeah. Um, I think it's in brands interest and creators interest to say we got a billion views on something. So they kind of both, but everybody knows that it's that the TikTok followers are fast and easy, right? Like in TikTok views can blow up and really quickly, but like, yeah, but I mean, YouTube followers are, or YouTube subscribers are always the most valuable because you can directly monetize them. Right. Mm -hmm. You recently mentioned on Twitter that um, one of your biggest frustrations this year is how VCs and people in Silicon Valley just discovered creators and influencers. Obviously, it has definitely gained prominence. I, I can say that from the inside as well. Like it's it's a hot topic of conversation. I think everyone is really interested in creator tools, creator platforms. All of a sudden, I'm curious, like what are some of the most prevalent misconceptions or things that you don't think people who are new to the space really understand about the creator world? Yeah, well, I said that and all these VCs, as always, take everything so personally and we're getting so upset. And I was like, I literally don't mean like most of you. Like there's a lot of people that are amazing that have been working in this space for so long. So many people at like, you know, Union Square Ventures funded these platforms and stuff. And then there's all these people that have backed, you know, like really amazing platforms like Patreon and stuff that have helped people monetize, obviously yourself, other, you know, people or like, you know, even Connie at Andreessen who really understands sort of like Asian tech and that ecosystem. But my frustration is more with these like uh, people that just write these like LinkedIn style, like Twitter threads on different things, kind of about like thought leadership stuff about this, like suddenly this industry that they don't know about. And mm -hmm. I guess my misconception is like that these platforms have always been really creator friendly. Like you see these VCs, oh, well, we funded MySpace back in the day, or we funded Musical.ly. So like we get creators. It's like, no, you funded a platform that actually was pretty inherently like hard for these creators and really never developed or Snapchat, you know, which famously like told creators, we don't want you, you know, like, so it's just, it's funny to have them now be like, oh, well, we funded that you know, platform. So we understand creators. It's like that platform was never catering to creators until maybe recently after TikTok has upended everything. And I think people are seeing the value of it now. Um, so that's kind of like my, my, the, that, the misunderstanding. Also, um, I saw a lot of, you know, VC people think of, of creators or influencers as like influencer marketing is sort of the only way that they understand it. And it's so much more than marketing and help and investing in like a brand deal platform or things like that. Um, so yeah, yeah. it's kind of that, that's like, that was my frustration was like on that. And it was a couple of very specific people that I didn't want to add cause they would get like offended. And then I ended up sort of unintentionally offending like everyone. And I was like, Oh my <laughs> God, you guys, this is not about you. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. As with all things on Twitter, it blows over. Um, but I totally agree with you that I think it's just a lot of the platforms in the last decade or so that have reached critical mass, they had creators on them for sure. And those creators were making a living, but they were making a living almost in spite of the platform yes. rather than because of the platform. Yes. Like Facebook and Instagram still to this day do not give creators a cut of the advertising revenue. Like they keep a hundred percent of the advertising revenue. People are always up in arms when there's questions about, um, Patreon and how they pay out creators or YouTube and how they monetize through advertising and, and who gets demonetized for their videos. But no one ever talks about how Facebook and Instagram don't pay anything to the creators. Like literally 
the content is created for free. I always talk about how basically content creators are like the unpaid interns for all of these platforms. They're doing the work, they're creating the content, they're driving the eyeballs, and yet they're not seeing any of the revenue. I mean, this even ties into some of the Prop 22 stuff that I was writing about yesterday, but I think there's just growing recognition of who is actually creating the value on all of these platforms. Um, and it's the content creators, it's the workers, it's the people who are actually putting in the labor and the time to make these platforms interesting from a consumer perspective. And I think finally, platforms are realizing that they need to compensate them. It's funny to hear you saying all this stuff because I don't know if you remember um, the memers union that there was a meme, a, a bunch of memes, oh, really? big meme account. Yeah, I'm gonna try to, well, it was 2018, a bunch of big Instagram. This was like also when Instagram meme accounts were like peaking and then getting banned and everything. And yeah. they, they formed a union, um, which- That's amazing. <laughs> was not Sa sag after or uh, WGA West or- No, but yeah, they got hundreds of like top meme accounts involved. And basically their whole like manifesto was this. It was like, we drive collectively billions of, you know, views of engagement. We have the youngest users, you know, all of our like audiences are some of the youngest, most in demand for advertisers. And like, we are getting shut down because they were running ads on their pages and like, you know, they were getting reported and all this stuff. And it's like, they just want to monetize. They're just trying to build. And so I think like, it's funny because people made so much fun or like, you know, all these people are like, oh, memer is unionizing, haha. -ha. But it's like, no, they are creating value. And all of these content creators are creating value for these platforms and the platforms know it. They recognize that. Totally. Yeah. That's amazing that they created a union. I didn't know that story, but that's, that's amazing to hear because I've been recently thinking about like, what can we learn from the labor movement from a century ago? Like what can creators and workers on these platforms take as the lessons from that. And I think like creators actually have more power than they recognize. Mm -hmm. Like if, if TikTok creators banded together, if even like Patreon creators banded together and made a ton of noise about how they want the platforms to be designed, how they want their incentives to be structured. I think the platforms would respond to that because they are like the well? reasons why. Yeah. Yeah. Because well, how they, did, how did Instagram respond to the memer union? They actually ended up hiring, somebody just put the link. Thank you so much for finding it faster than I could have. Uh, it was last April. Wow, God, that was so long ago. Um, yeah. They ended up hiring this guy, Ricky Sands, who works on their digital partnerships team now to kind of manage relationships with the meme community because they realized that like, this was a growing niche of publishers that they actually weren't serving. And so it's funny because since they hired Ricky, I feel like it, it has brought a lot of the tension down. Like the, the, the meme kind of fell, the union kind of fell apart because people started to feel a little bit better. They weren't getting their account. Like the really big people were more happy. So they're still like constantly like how YouTubers are frustrated with YouTube Instagrammers or, you know, memers are always frustrated with Instagram, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it was interesting to see in that case. And I ended up writing about it too, when Instagram hired that memer liaison, um, because it was them sort of, I think they did recognize that these people could influence their plat, that they were influencing their platform. And it was so. That's awesome. Well, that's an optimistic sign. Cause Leah, when you said that you thought the platforms would respond well, my first reaction was like, normally businesses don't respond well when their employees want to unionize and like some, some respond better than others, but it's just, you know, it's tough basically. And so platforms with, with their sort of creator participants unionizing feels like maybe could be well, a similar dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, I just will say, it's not like they really met any of their demands. It's more okay. that they hired this person to kind of act as a partnerships person to kind of like, you know, quell some of the anger among the biggest people. So I think that's kind of what happened. Like, I wouldn't right. say that, you know, there haven't been any like plat like, like feature changes, for instance. Um, I think one thing that the creators have going in their favor versus a lot of the organized labor movements of, you know, past centuries is that these are differentiated individuals. If Charlie D'Amelio is protesting TikTok for some reason, like there's no other Charlie D'Amelio that they could fire her and replace her with. Like the audience has established loyalty with her and with a bunch of other creators that they really deeply care about. And in a way they're irreplaceable. That's unlike previous workers who were in a factory basically offering commoditized labor and being right. completely interchangeable with another cohort of workers that the factory could just hire to replace them. Hard to find a scab that can do the renegade as good as uh <laughs> Indeed. I've tried and it's hard. <laughs> yeah. The last question before we 
hand it over to the audience and do some Q&A is this was a really hotly requested topic of conversation, just sort of addressing the tension and the conflict that exists between Silicon Valley and journalism and the media world. It's definitely, there's been lots of clashes and, and tension erupting, for instance, on Twitter. What do you think is underpinning the sentiment on both sides? Yeah, it's funny. I never knew about VC Twitter until this spring. Um, and <laughs> it's a crazy world. And now I'm in there, like, I feel like I'm adjacent to it where they like constantly like talk about my stuff in a way that they used to just ignore me. Like, and I, this was my kind of like frustration, but also now I realize a blessing that they basically ignored everything I did because I never had to listen to these people. I only listen to really smart people. Like, you know, the, a lot of the VCs that I speak to regularly just because they're smart and interesting, but you didn't have these kind of like thought leadership grifter people that were kind of inserting themselves. Um, but it's interesting. I mean, I, it's, I, I very much, I, I hate this term citizen journalism, like citizen journalism is like QAnon, like it's like people that have no understanding of anything, like my, that's my interpretation, like kind of like reporting, but usually posting conspiracy theories or things like that don't have anything to do, like it, I don't, I don't like that term, I guess. Um, but I do believe in like a more open media environment. I do feel like journalism itself is a trade. And to do real journalism, like which you're like holding power to account and like all like a lot of the stuff that like the New York Times publishes, like a lot of the, some of the stories that I've done, like I could not do that independently. You know, I wrote about this guy, Arya Tufanian, who scammed, you know, hundreds of thousands of college kids basically out of money and ran this huge Instagram, you know, bullshit scheme. I could never do that story independently because I don't have legal resources. I don't have fact checker. I don't have like all of this stuff basically um, that the Times provides me with. That's I know Substack's trying to provide some of that stuff for people, but I think right now it's just it's too hard. Um, but there's a lot of like stuff that's not real. It's 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 reporting, but it's also like a lot of what I write too is like kind of um, contextualizing something or reframing something or telling a story that's not you know you're not taking on like you know liability or you're not you, sort of it's not a danger to you to publish. So um, that stuff I do think that like we're we're seeing it like open up a lot more. I mean I watch a lot of YouTube um, like drama channels and recap channels and. Um, I don't know if, do you guys know Tiffany Ferguson? Did we talk about her before? Oh my God, wait, you guys would love her. Somebody needs to find her channel. She's so good. She's a YouTuber. And like, I, I feel like if I was younger, like that's who I would wanna be. Like she covers the same stuff, similar stuff to me, but like in these YouTube video essays kind of. And um, I don't know, like, I think that, I think that that type of journalism is is interesting and and I love that and I think it's been amazing to see the media ecosystem open up a bit. I have my job because of Tumblr because I created a lot of popular sites on Tumblr. So, you know, I think like I more than anyone understand the value of not just having people go through this traditional path. Um, last thing I'll say, sorry, I keep talking, but um, it seems to be that the VCs that have problems with the media are the ones that don't like critical coverage of themselves or their companies. That's it, like they're not, that's what they're mad about. And they're, and they're playing into this, like, frankly, you know, far right narrative of the media is biased and the media is whatever. And, you know, I have problems with the media in general too, but I think it's a very valuable check on power. Um, if it's done well, you know, if reporting is done fairly um, and, you know, these people don't want a check. I mean, you saw like Jason Calacanis being like, when I asked him what's an example of good journalism and he was like, well, nobody writes the positive stories about Calm app or something. And it's like, that's PR, like that's PR. Writing a positive success story about an app you invested in is PR. Like that's not, you know, that might be interesting and you might, that might still be a story that runs somewhere. Like, wow, this app is changing people's lives, but that's not, you know, like, that's not what you mean when you say you want to shut down journalism. You want to shut down critical coverage of yourself and your companies. I agree with you. No, I, I completely agree. As an alum of the Harvard Crimson <laughs> and the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, I, I do think journalism as a trade, as a skill, as a profession still has an important place in our society. I think a lot of the people calling for citizen journalism and distributed truth I think they're missing a lot of the contextualization and the narratives that are also valuable that surround the truth. Like facts in and of themselves, statistics, numbers, like obviously they do exist, but there's a lot of stories that are more nuanced where perhaps the idea of 
what is true is not a single statement or number or fact. It's a story um, and it's a narrative that the journalist has to go out and, and find and uncover. We were on Eric Tornberg's podcast talking about this a few weeks ago, Nate and I, um, or a few months ago. And I, (laughs) time flies. And I basically compared it to, you know, people who are calling for just journalism to be done by everyone in society. They're sort of making the argument that the analogous thing would be if VCs didn't have jobs anymore and LPs were the capital allocators into startups. And every family office, every endowment, every pension fund had to go find and sift through all of the startups themselves. Like, obviously, that is a tremendous amount of work. And to expect that of every citizen in America to go out and find their own truth and do the research, I think it's just a level of work that most people don't have the time to invest in. And that's why we have intermediaries like VCs to do the full-time work of finding startups similar to journalism. Well, it's also, I mean, when you do, when you, when you are just doing your own research, right? Like often what you end up with is conspiracy theories. And like, I mean, I've seen the rise of and written a bunch, not as much anymore, but I used to write much more about QAnon and stuff like that. And that is very much like people seeking to circumvent, you know, traditional media and find their own truths. And you end up often buying into these bad faith narratives, or you're suddenly find yourself 10 videos deep into something that is pushing this very deranged view. And that that's why you need like reputable intermediaries. Um, And I think it's hard and I'm sympathetic to the fact that I don't think that traditional media has always been the most reputable intermediaries. Like, you know, they definitely only focus on the stories of just very privileged people. Sometimes they hire very privileged people sometimes. Also, you know, they both sides things, they mess things up. Like it's not perfect. Um, But you, you, like you said, you still need that. You still need that intermediary level. Um, And I do think it's great. I mean, I do really, I really do believe in sort of the disruption of media or whatever. I mean, I do think like Substack has been amazing in so many different ways and I love YouTube channels and all of this stuff, but like new platforms, but still sort of like, you know, maintaining journalistic integrity and all of that. But yeah, it's, it's just like, also it's like the, the, anti V the anti-media stuff like it seems that all those people have a very similar view where they they are very anti-media but then they they regularly buy into stuff from the right-wing media ecosystem so it's like you you say you're anti-media but then you're supporting this alternate media ecosystem that's frankly very biased and dangerous and so you know whereas like there's um, Emily Bazelon, who's a writer for the New York Times Magazine, recently wrote about this tension between free speech and, um, you know, sort of an open disinformation and uh, this environment. And she wrote, wrote this feature in New York Mag, and she's a lawyer herself and kind of wrote about these tensions. But, um, you know, it, in the traditional media ecosystem, for instance, if the New York Times like fucked a story up, like the Washington Post will run a story like that debunking it. And that was that's seen as kind of a like, wow, you, you fucked up and we got the real truth. If Breitbart runs some crazy thing, you're not going to see the Daily Caller debunking it. Often they just stoke those narratives. And so that I think that's what's so dangerous. And it seems like a lot of these VCs um, that are so critical of the media, then they buy into the, it's like they just want this alternate media ecosystem, which is right. So yeah, they're just anti some media that's critical. Yeah, they're anti hard reporting against their, themselves or their companies you know that's what they that's what they don't want and totally. it's funny i i don't know eric torenberg but i saw that he was offering this class where he was like literally having like biology on and stuff to talk about and i was like what the hell who put this together <laughs> it was like like interviewing biology about journalism or something and i was like oh my god i honestly think a lot of people in tech twitter are just confused about like how journalism works and like what is needed and to to, to do it well and um i i think there's more confusion than there is malice i think there's some malice and there's some defensiveness but i think there's a lot of confusion um and i think the biggest thing that that is concerning to me is the fact that like when we talk about citizen journalism or like everything's getting fragmented there's one part of that that's like what lee said which is like oh there's this real thing in capitalism called specialization and gains from trade and like journalists specialize because it's hard and you need to do a thing to do a thing hard you need to focus on it to focus on it you need to get paid to do it so there, there becomes companies and that's like how it works right that's great also if there's a media world where all the providers are super fragmented then none of them have very much power And what you want, if you have a lot of power, is for someone uh, not to be able to have a lot of counter power to you. And so 
big powerful institutions like the New York Times, which frankly are like a lot less powerful than a lot of people <laughs> want to make it out to be. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, relative to an individual, right? Like they're able to defend against lawsuits or, you know, they're able to vet stories with the amount of resources that it requires. And they have this sort of institutional legacy of like, you know, in, in culture to kind of like fried check something. It's not like the New York Times has never gotten anything wrong. Of course, I don't think anyone would say, would say that, but just on average, would you rather have a media environment that has some institutions, multiple institutions preferably, that have enough power to be able to break hard stories, to dig up truths that people want not to come up? Or do you want there to be a bunch of citizens that have no power? Yeah, exactly. It's a good time to switch to audience questions and bring people up on stage to do some Q&A with us. Yeah, I saw a really good one from Liza. Yeah, I was really excited to see this come up on my Twitter feed last night. So I'm a student journalist. I'm on my last semester and I write a lot about internet culture. It's kind of became like a love for myself because I was an internet kid. And I was kind of wondering how you kind of personally answer the question, why is this important? Personally, like I was writing about the TikTok ban for my college paper and maybe an hour into it, the RBG news came up and I kind of just sat there for a second just like, what is important and why am I still writing this? <laughs> I want to uh, hear your thoughts on how you answer those questions for yourself and keep going talking about influencers and creators. And yeah, yeah. I've done other things and I've covered other beats and I often pitch in on hard news stories. I mean, I've written about shootings and a lot of, a lot of hard news in the past, which is, you know, it is what it is. Um, I, I like writing about a specific week right now, like the creator economy. Like, yeah, some days with coronavirus, right? I'm like, am I, you know, am I doing the most essential work right now writing about this White House when 200,000 people are sick? Like, it can you can feel that way sometimes, but ultimately, like, this is a very interesting, amazing emerging industry. And I think that there is value for culture coverage and um, tech coverage and all of that stuff. And it actually, you know, these are things that really do impact our life in a huge way. And so I do, I do very much feel like it's valuable. And sometimes you have those days where, yeah, of course things are put in perspective, but I felt so passionate about this beat for so long and validating this industry as legitimate that like, I very much you know, I, I feel it's very worthy in its own way. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you, Taylor. Like, I think a lot of the topics that we both cover and study are often dismissed as frivolous and meaningless and shallow. But I think, I mean, it touches on so many deeper themes. Like a lot of these platforms are so omnipresent in our lives and they represent real ways that people are making money and they are a critical part of the economy now. Like these platforms represent sources of income for millions of people. And I think that is very important. And beyond that, I think the entertainment value that they provide is it impacts such a huge scale of individuals in the world that I don't think it's any less valid or important than hard news and other topics that people cover. I often um, felt this when I was at Andreessen Horowitz and, and I would sit in on some of the bio startup pitches and these companies were working on, you know, curing cancer or expanding longevity for humans, things like that. And I would sometimes feel a little bit insecure, like what am I funding? Like we are funding platforms on which memes get created and short form videos and, and dances. like. Am I, am I doing stuff that actually matters? And I think it's very easy to feel that way when you contrast it with something that's very life or death, but the scale of impact that consumer platforms have is truly massive. They're used by everyone. They represent a growing and legitimate career path for a lot of young people. So I think that we are doing important work. And it's shaping the culture in yes. so many different, like down the way, you know, like I wrote about like the Marky verse and some of the like, political implications of some of these fandoms and communities and online culture. And like, I just think that it impact, it, it, it's such an impact, it, it, it's impactful in kind of like insidious ways, but you do see kind of the effects of some of this stuff boil out into, into a lot of hard news, you know? Um, yeah, totally. I feel like it's pretty impossible to imagine a world where like 50 years from now, we're looking at the history books written about our current era and the number one story is not the way that culture, uh, which shapes politics, which shapes the economy, which shapes everything, was totally turned upside down by a, an enormous shift in the way that we communicate and consume media. And like, there's no, it's like covering 
the drama that was going on in the Vatican versus like little stuff that was going on with the printing press and with like, you know, the Protestant revolution back in the day, like you would think that the big drama at the Vatican was the big deal, but actually like the printing press and the Protestant revolution was the big deal. And like, that's what is, that's what's going on here. That's what I think at least. <laughs> no, for sure. Also, you just need contextual, like you need, especially like with a lot of the stuff that's happening. I'm just thinking of like the Christchurch shooting, for instance, like that shooter's manifesto, the fact that he was screaming about, or, you know, said subscribe to PewDiePie. Like there's all these levels of like understanding that you have to have now in regards to the internet and creators and culture and stuff that I think, yeah, it just like Lee said too, it impacts everything. So I hope that you become an internet culture writer too. <laughs> I really, I sincerely hope to, so too. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Uh, we have another question. Kunal asked, would you go independent uh, on Substack if they uh, promise legal support? I've yeah. talked to Substack a lot. I've, Hamish is a good friend of mine. I love Substack. I, I, you know, I have a Substack that I'm really bad at sending and Hamish is always trying to get me to send it more. I, um, you know, I say this a lot because a lot of people like in the past six months, a lot of people are like, why aren't you independent? Why aren't you independent? I, you know, I, um, I helped start the, I came up with this business plan and like sort of started this sort of media brand within Time Inc. that was specifically focused on covering internet creators in 2015. It ended up living under People Magazine and EW. And um, putting together that business plan and having to like handle all of that stuff related to it, like it just made me realize I don't want to be like an entrepreneur, especially right now. I really get a lot of value from working within a big organization and having that stability. Um, and I think that, you know, Casey, what Casey's done is amazing. Also like an amazing person, but I, I don't like that as much. Like I really like to focus on writing and, um, I worry with Substack, even if they provided legal support, that I'd still be focusing a lot on audience growth and monetization and all of that stuff that takes away from my writing. And so, um, so right now, I will not. But you never know what the future holds. Uh, <laughs> but I am a big fan of Substack. I think it's amazing what they've built. Totally. Um, why do you Basic think Quibi didn't work while TikTok oh. succeeded? <laughs> Obviously, Quibi had the scale of capital that we were talking about. Yeah, talk. but like, I, I will tell you, I listen to the Andreessen podcast a lot, even though whatever, I always have drama with some people there. Um, the podcast is great. And I was listening to Meg Whitman talk about it. I think it was like a recording of a live event last year. And I have to tell you this woman, I was just like, there's no way this will ever succeed. She was, I think what, why part of like the problem with Quibi, and I just remember her, she was talking about how there's like no content on your phone, basically. Like she was like talking about like, I can't remember what she was saying exactly, but it was basically like, I'm in the grocery store line and I want to look at, I want to watch something. There's no, there's no good content online on my phone. And I'm like, what? I think it was this like undervaluing of the creativity of, of online platforms and the content and, and the pre like, you know, they kept saying, oh, there's no premium content in this short form. There actually is a ton of it. Um, and it's delivered in this really compelling way with like, you know, like, I mean, Instagram creators, for instance, like you can watch Instagram stories for five seconds and get really interesting content from that. Like whatever they were trying to do with the quick bites and the short form video, it's like, I just think it was like meeting a need that wasn't there. I think that, um, I think that that's what their misunderstanding was. I think that they wildly underestimated how compelling stuff on the internet already is and how yeah. accessible that is. And also how easy it is if you really did want to watch 10 minutes of a show to just open it up and watch. You don't need it necessarily pre-formatted. Um, mm -hmm. Also the concepts of the shows that they bought were like a parody. Like I think that that was also a, a misstep. You know, I think if they had had certain breakout successes maybe, but I think that the shows that they ultimately invested in were like, it seemed to be everybody's B material. Like I talked to a lot of people in entertainment and they were like, it was more like, oh, you try to sell something to Netflix. You try to sell something to the more better places. And then you take your like C, your D list material to Quibi. So I, that, I think that was also an issue that they just didn't have it. Yeah. I was at that talk in real life. I remember oh um, listening to them on stage. Yeah. I think one of the biggest changes in the last year since they gave that talk was just the rise of TikTok mm -hmm. and all of this like produced content that had people pouring a ton of time and thought and planning into it. It is very high quality. It is well-produced. There's sub-segments within TikTok that you can drill down into. There's like food TikTok, home TikTok, all of these different categories of amazing content. And so, yeah, I, I agree with you that 
the pain point was not as acute as they had described. Yeah. So RIP. It does suck for the people that, you know, work on it and stuff because that I that really sucks. You know, it sucks to like have that much hype and be that invested and then, you know, have it fail. So and the product itself I think was really nice looking and easy to use. And so definitely it was doomed. (laughs) Yeah. It's uh it's always sad because like you you know, it's you don't want to like root for anyone's failure. But even if you see something and you're like, I just don't think this is going to work. And then when it doesn't work, it kind of feels good. Cause you're like, I was, I think it was, I think it was, I mean, I saw a lot of people being like, don't hate on Quibi and I, I get it, but like, you know, especially in the pandemic, it sucks to root for any company's failure, but I think it was the arrogance that Jeffrey Katzenberg and Meg Whitman had that like felt very vindicating to a lot of people online, you know, because they were, or it felt vindicating to kind of see that see that, see that they were ultimately proved wrong. Cause I, I, there was that one, I think it was a New York times article where he was basically like blaming the pandemic being for their failure. And it's like, that right. was no. <laughs> so. Yeah. Hard to see the upside of, of not taking responsibility. For- <laughs> yeah. And just like being overpaid, you know, classic overpaid executive trying to kind of build this thing. So that's, that's my opinion on, on Quibi. Well, so we are, we're now over time, unfortunately, there's a ton of questions that are still remaining here unanswered. Maybe one day we can get Taylor back on the show and do more Q and A instead of monopolizing all of the time. But until then, where can people find you on the internet? Do you write a newsletter that we can subscribe to? Are there links that you'd like to plug? I do have uh, my sub stack that I never send out, but maybe one day I will. <laughs> Um, which is just taylorlorenz.substack.com. But until then, um, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. So just at taylorlorenz on Twitter and Instagram. Um, So please follow me there. And sometimes people don't like my tweets. My tweets can be a little bit crazy, um, but that's okay. You know, you can still DM me or message me or reach out via email or Instagram. I think think my Twitter presence has gotten a little uh, intense over the past few months. I tweet a lot. You know, we're all stuck inside and I'm like, oh, on. I think some people are like, oh my God, you tweet too much. I have to unfollow you. But so I wouldn't take offense. You can still reach out. Even if you don't follow me, feel free to email me taylor.lorenz at NY Times. And sorry, I couldn't get to all of these questions, but, um, you know, I hopefully will be back. And it's always great chatting with you guys. Yeah, Thank you so much for joining amazing. us. This amazing. I, I, I'm so honored to be on this show. I feel like this is so cool. And um, yeah, I'm glad that we got to chat and hopefully, hopefully chat again soon. Thank you. Yeah, yeah this is a new media platform that, Zoom is like the new social (laughs) entertainment network. Thank you so much, Taylor, for being here today. And thank you for all of the attendees for being here and for asking such thoughtful questions. I'm sure we'll get Taylor back, hopefully, fingers crossed one day. Thanks for joining us and have a great weekend, everyone. You too. Bye. See ya. Bye.